Welcome back, everyone. Sorry for the abrupt transition from the music there. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all back to the home stretch of our programming this afternoon. Uh, right now, we're going to be hearing from our Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, that's Elizabeth Simmons. She serves as our Chief Academic Officer, is the responsible for policies and decisions related to academic programs and faculty appointments. Uh, in her spare time, she's a theoretical high energy physicist. I don't know how much spare time she has these days. She and Peter have worked very closely over the years on a great number of issues, and it's a great pleasure for me to hand the microphone over to Dr. Elizabeth Simmons for a few words. Thanks so very much, Josh. Um, well, this is a bittersweet moment for all of us. We all wish the best for Peter, but we're really going to miss him. Um, I've been asked to say a few words about the amazing faculty team that Peter has built at GPS over the years. And indeed, since becoming dean in uh, 2002, uh, Peter has hired nearly all the current active faculty of GPS, shaping the school's intellectual agenda and its outlook in profound ways. The faculty he has hired uh, are diverse in origin, in demographics, in prior experience, all of which, on the one hand, shapes their approach to research and to supporting the increasingly diverse student body of GPS. And on the other hand, uh, the diversity also keeps the school constantly renewed in outlook and in methodologies. The faculty now include not only ladder rank faculty, but also uh, teaching professors and professors of practice, bringing different kinds of experience and expertise into the classroom. There are now also numerous joint appointees, certainly with economics, with political science, with Rady School of Management as one might possibly have expected, but also with Scripps Institution for Oceanography and with the Jacobs School of Engineering, perhaps a little more unexpected. And indeed, one of the most interesting things about the faculty composition at GPS has been the widening range of intellectual interests. Uh, a simple word cloud of the research field shows the expected emphasis on matters political, strategic, and economic, on finance and markets, on many countries of the Pacific Rim, but also an emphasis on conflict, war, insurgency, and terrorism on industry, manufacturing, and technology, neuroscience, neuroeconomics, and behavior, agriculture, climate, fertility, migration, and energy, to name just a few of the, of the clusters. And I think that the inclusion of, of the many topics relating to science and technology and their overlap with policy, uh, it has, has been um, a truly wonderful uh, addition to the fabric of the school. This kind of academic breadth makes GPS a powerful intellectual force and a valuable partner within our campus, but also within the broader, not only academic world, but world of practice and government and action. So how has Peter accomplished this? And I think it's really been a combination. Uh, of course, strategic thinking. He is always looking at um, multiple sequences of potential future moves on the GPS multi-dimensional chessboard, as anybody who knows him is aware. He's also been very creative in sourcing faculty candidates, looking for talent very widely and very deliberately. I've seen him be a very persuasive negotiator with faculty candidates. And then beyond the hiring stages, paying very careful attention to the careers of faculty who are here advocating for retentions, for promotions, for opportunities that will enhance their intellectual lives. He's also worked very hard to build a cohesive culture within GPS that enables the faculty to be their most productive and engaged self. And of course, he has undertaken significant individual mentoring, as we saw in the um, you know, mention in some of the slides in uh, what people were talking about with their, their uh, their personal reminiscences about Peter. And so myself on a more personal note, I would say that I have also been the beneficiary of that same mentoring during my four years at UC San Diego. Peter has been a wonderful source of ideas, has been a great touchstone for how others on campus might be perceiving the events of the day. 
and has a great crystal ball for things that are just about to appear over the horizon. So I feel very fortunate to have had the chance to collaborate with him and to learn from him. So congratulations, Peter, um, and uh, best wishes. And now I think we're going to hear uh, some more fascinating things on the next panel. Back to you, Josh. Thank you, EVC Simmons. Um, I, I have to say, one, one of the great pleasures of this event today uh, for me personally is I, I, I know Peter in many capacities, but not but all of you sort of interact with Peter in a different, through a different lens. And so it's so, so nice and refreshing to hear the varied perspectives. There are obviously recurring themes, but, but, but from, from very different perspectives is, is, is wonderful to hear. I'm here to now introduce our next and final panel. This panel is focused on Peter's vision and leadership at the helm of GPS. And I want to start by stating the obvious. Peter was not just a remarkable dean, but an incredibly entrepreneurial one. We've heard snippets and bits and pieces of that, but every one of you on this call has seen evidence of this in some form or another. I also want to say it's no secret that deans in general are often unloved by at least some of their faculty because at least a good dean has to drive the ship and make decisions and not every decision includes everyone. This is not so for Peter. And that is quite remarkable for a dean who's made many decisions and pushed their faculty to move in directions they didn't necessarily know they wanted to move in. And yet has done so in a way that has made everybody feel included and excited about the project. And that is quite remarkable. His approach and genius as an innovative leader really eludes description. And let's be clear, if it didn't, we'd bottle the secret sauce and sell it across the globe. And Pradeep, don't worry, we'd do it through the UCSD Office of Tech Transfer, so we'd make sure you get your royalties. But I'm trying here, I want us to think about what can we say about this leadership that we've heard so much about. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm left with nothing but analogies, right? And, and herding cats is the standard university analogy we bring in. I tried out many different versions of this, um, most of which were vetoed by my wife as not good enough or by my kids as too boring. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this one on for size, and hopefully it resonates at least for some of you. I think a faculty is a lot like an orchestra in the making. That is to say, each member of the faculty is really good at one or maybe a handful of instruments. At the same time, a professional school, and for that matter, any school, has many audiences, internal audiences, internal audiences within the school, across the schools, within the university, across the broader community, and beyond. And all of those audiences have very different tastes in music. The faculty like classical music, the chancellor favors punk rock, policymakers like free jazz, and so forth and so on. Somebody has to put this all together, and Peter has spent 20 years as a remarkable conductor, allowing each faculty to mem member to flex their instru instrumental muscle toward a common compositional goal that resonates for a great many audiences. That is a remarkable skill. And one thing I will say, I, I cannot uh, summarize, I cannot delineate all the characters that allow Peter to do this, but one thing, and I, I think we've heard some of it, but maybe not enough of it today. Peter is a remarkable thinker. Peter is a remarkable leader. Part of why that is true in both dimensions is because Peter is a remark remarkable listener. With that said, I'm gonna turn the microphone to our Chancellor Pradeep Khosla. Chancellor, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Josh. Uh, that was a great speech. And I think you captured the essence of Peter just about perfectly. I don't think anybody could have done it better. Uh, before I make comments about uh, Peter's vision, let me I have a special announcement to make. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, this center, which has always intrigued me uh, ever since I've known about it. Uh, and also it intrigues other people too. It's called the Center for, uh, Center for Global Transformation. It was something that Peter was extremely committed to, is extremely committed to. It's something that Josh, uh, our MC, 
uh, is the director of right now. And this is actually a very interesting and a unique center. It addresses the questions of science, technology, policy, global economy, and the transformation of all of these things and the, their interactions and the transformations that are happening around the world. And it does this by, uh, by driving a diverse agenda of academic inquiry and policy analysis. Um, and it also does this by supporting innovation and research. Uh, and not to mention, there's a very special program out here called the Pacific uh, Leadership Fellows Program, uh, which brings thought leaders from all over the world, but primarily from the Pacific and immerses them in San Diego uh, and allows them to develop insights, not just from San Diego, but also from uh, GPS and the faculty and uh, from this program. So clearly this, at least in my mind, is a very uh, innovative, futuristic, uh, visionary center uh, worthy of every piece of support that it gets. Uh, let me now talk a little bit about two of my favorite people, Joan and Irwin Jacobs, who are also visionary in their own right, not just because of what they have done in their lives, but when it comes to UC San Diego, there's hardly a part of UC San Diego that has not been touched. Uh, Jacobs School of Engineering, Jacobs Medical Center, but these are the two big things that are named for them. But more importantly, there are dozens of faculty members whose lives they have touched individually by supporting their research, by supporting innovative ideas, by identifying good ideas. And now, you should not be surprised at all if I were to connect the two and say Joan and Irvin Jacobs at some point identified the Center for Global Transformation as both visionary, unique, and innovative, uh, and thanks to Peter's leadership. And they've been supporting this center uh, for multiple years now. They're really committed to it. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, what they have asked me to do is make a special announcement on their behalf, which is that they are gonna endow this center at $14 million so that it can give out about 560,000 a year for the director to deploy, employ, and use uh, in the context of furthering this, furthering this agenda. Equally importantly, they have asked me to announce that they want this center to be named the Peter F. Cowie Center on Global Transformation. Peter, uh, you are a transformative person and there would not have been, there could not be a more appropriate center that would be named after you. So congratulations, Peter uh, and Joan and Irwin, my deepest gratitude, my deepest thanks. I cannot thank you enough, so thank you. Please everybody join me in giving them a big hand. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about Peter now and what he has done uh, besides the Center for Global Transformation. Uh, I think uh, if you look at uh, UC San Diego, if you look at the way we've been talking about ourselves and branding ourselves, uh, we have used the word non-tradition because everything we do is kind of, it's in the sense of non-traditional, it's not traditional. And Peter is, he actually epitomizes what non-tradition means. He thinks beyond GPS to leverage UC San Diego and UC resources to the benefit of all. Uh, you've heard people say this before, he's created a culture of collaboration and innovation. Uh, he supports and, uh, new and innovative ideas. He nurtures new and innovative ideas. Uh, and with its domestic and international policy expertise, he's positioned GPS to add value to other units of campus as UC San Diego focuses on uh, global issues. So this is why I said in the morning that uh, GPS sits at the nexus of science, technology, uh, policy right here for UC San Diego. And uh, it's actually a point of pride uh, for all of us. So let's just talk about a couple of examples where uh, Peter has really, and these couple of examples don't quite do justice to how much Peter has contributed. But if you put this in the context of what everybody else is saying, uh, I think Peter will forgive me for not talking about everything that he has done. Uh, so the centers uh, that I wanna talk about are the Sudan UC Center on Contemporary China. Uh, this actually, when I, came here, I had no idea that uh, UC San Diego was uh, connected so tightly with China. And this is a center that's close to my heart because I think a lot of the future, even though we are facing a lot of challenges right now, uh, 10 years ago, a lot of the action was in China. Uh, and I think this is a center that Susan Shirk, who's the chair of the 21st Century China Center, Dick Madsen, who is the director of the UC Fudan Center, uh, and, Peter, and Peter, together, they led efforts to ensure that the center was housed at UC San Diego. So this center, 
focuses on contemporary China, connects all 10 UC campuses. So it's a multi-UC center. Uh, and these collaborations promote a deeper mutual understanding between US and China uh, through both institutions. Uh, and Peter is very committed to this. I know this because whenever the Chinese delegation visits, uh, Peter makes sure that I'm there to say hi to them and welcome them. And so this is another aspect of Peter where he understands politically what kind of makes sense. He understands the culture, in this case, the Chinese culture and what is acceptable and what is not and what's the right protocol. And uh, that's why I think the center has been so successful. The other center, which uh, of course I also have a soft spot for is the UC Institute for Global Conflict and Cooperation. So this was founded way back in 1982. And this was founded uh, to basically uh, think about uh, global conflicts and cooperation and how does the world evolve in this context. So what it does, it, it convenes expert researchers from UC campuses, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos laboratories, uh, and along with US and international policy leaders, IGCC addresses global challenges to peace and prosperity. Uh, this was also founded because at the time when we started managing the DOE labs, there was a deal made uh, that we needed to think about not just managing the nuclear labs, but also the impact of our nuclear policy, the nuclear weapons, and how would we, uh, in addition to building the defense systems, also promote peace and cooperation. So this center has actually an interesting history. And well, one part of that history, uh, which of course goes back to Peter, is he led this center from 99 to 2006. And I think he was responsible for making GPS in UC San Diego, uh, the base for IGCC. Another initiative that comes to mind is a deep decarbonization initiative, a strong collaboration between uh, faculty in, uh, at GPS and JSOE. So I can keep on going down the list, but in each one of these initiatives, I can tell you that the one that is has not happened yet, it's about to happen, is the 21st century India China that uh, Peter is leading or is going to lead. So in all of these, Peter always has this creative touch to it where he always comes to me because he knows I like good deals with a good deal, a deal that I cannot refuse, which actually is true. Intellectually, the deals are exciting. Uh, from a futuristic point of view, they point to the future, they're innovative, uh, but from a pocketbook point of view, they hit my pocketbook. But what can I say? Anything that we do for the good of UC San Diego is done for the right reasons. And Peter, you have been amazing in that respect. So again, thank you very much, sir, uh, for your vision and for your support. And uh, let me just say, hand this back over to our MC, Josh. Thanks, Pradeep. Um, let, let me, uh, first, I'm delighted to know that, um, that I'm not the only one who gets offers they can't refuse from Peter. Uh, so let me start first by just saying um, a quick uh, thank you to Joan and Erwin for the support. I have to say as CGT director, I, I'm personally incredibly grateful, but I also want to express my gratitude on behalf of the faculty at GPS and across the campus who look to CGT to support their innovative research. Uh, this gift's going to help us launch a new global science and technology policy effort, which I hope we can use to lure Peter off of the beach or out of his armchair and onto campus to help us engage there. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you for the support for CGT and for the support um, that you provided to all of UCSD uh, across, over the years and, and across campus. Now we're going to switch gears and we're going to introduce our next panelist, uh, Jennifer Burney. Jen is an associate professor here at GPS. She is the Marshall Saunders Chancellor's Endowed Chair in Global Climate Policy and Research. Uh, I like to say that Jen is the total package. She's an environmental scientist with a PhD in physics whose research focuses on global food security and mitigating climate change, really sort of hitting on all the fronts that are so fundamental to our vision and build out of GPS. She is the prime example, the epitome of Peter's entrepreneurial investments at the intersection of STEM and policy, and the one that has catalyzed many additional activities for GPS, both within the school and across the campus. It is my pleasure to pass the microphone over to you. Jen, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so uh, among other pieces of our reputation, uh, GPS has become known as a place that has successfully integrated a broad range of scholars uh, into a policy school. 
uh, including physical scientists and engineers. So since I'm one of them, uh, I've been asked to talk for a few minutes uh, about what Peter has done uh, to really make GPS special in this particular dimension. Um, in the spirit of today, I of course want to shine a light on Peter's vision and creativity and, and his sheer skill uh, in blazing this new path. But um, since Peter is a, is a true lover of and scholar of institutions, and because he is a, a sort of mind-blowingly humble man, uh, I also want to honor that spirit. And so I'm going to present uh, a little bit today in the form of lessons that his process of turning uh, GPS into a more multidimensional institution has taught the rest of us. So I think um, the first lesson from Peter is to have an imagination, to think about uh, what's not there but could be, and to not be bound by convention. The community here today has already painted a really beautiful picture of just how purely um, Peter is a question or problem driven person. Uh, everything he's done and the way he's operated as a dean rests on this core idea, right? That, that answering the world's most pressing and interesting questions requires understanding the various incentives and constraints operating in that space. But whereas other social scientists or policymakers or deans might stop at social, political, and economic forces, Peter's never had any issue extending that basic idea into other domains. This has been evident today in all of his work on ICT, uh, some of the comments John Holdren has made, and, and any another number of other things people have said. Um, but it comes to this. He's, he's a person that broadly believes that you have to know how the system works. And so over his deanship, that's meant that GPS has come to espouse a, a broader understanding that people and communities and societies and institutions were not only subject to social forces, our lives and decisions are shaped by biological forces, the disease environment we live in, epigenetics, the very structure and development of our brains. Our lives and decisions are shaped, shaped by our physical environments, our interactions with natural ecosystems and their services, exposures to clean or dirty air and water, and the hazards of our changing climate. And of course, our lives and decisions are shaped by the built and engineered environments, the structure of our cities, our energy and transportation systems, our communications infrastructures. And, you know, in addition to being shaped by these biological, physical, and, and engineered environments, all the decisions that we in turn make as humans, communities, societies, feed right back into those systems. And so GPS, under Peter's leadership has really become a place that, like Peter, is fundamentally about how humans, our organization and our decisions, really live within the broader Earth system. So our faculty are thinking about how humanity can thrive and coexist on this planet, and, it, and we're really doing so in Peter's mold without really respecting any disciplinary boundaries. Um, Peter has hired a climate modeler, a hydrologist, some engineers, a neuroscientist, but wait, there's more. Uh, we, have a, we have people with deep public health, agriculture, and environment experience. And we have a whole cadre of individuals uh, with different degrees on paper, but who have, uh, in part for the Center on Global Transformation, uh, I guess I should say uh, now, uh, the Peter Cowie Center on Global Transformation, uh, have built out methods and techniques for understanding uh, the world in new ways through remote sensing and geospatial analysis. And the spirit you know, is not confined to our STEM faculty, it really spills out to the more standard fields uh, represented in policy schools as well. Our economists, our political scientists, and our management faculty are surely recognized as world leaders within their own disciplines, but they have this anti-authoritarian spirit. They have the Peter um, sparkle in their eye. They won't be penned in. And the thing that really ties us all together, which Peter himself mentioned earlier is that we believe that understanding and innovation can truly make the world uh, a better place for all. The second lesson from Peter uh, is to not shy away from making the sausage. And in fact, to maybe own and even relish the sausage making process and to be creative about it. Integrating STEM into GPS has taken both vision, which I've described and which Peter has in abundance, but also uh, a real even keeled skill at navigating the dinosaur that is the academic bureaucracy. Um, Peter's been really entrepreneurial about hiring as has already been mentioned. Uh, some of us are fully appointed within GPS. Some of us are jointly appointed with other departments and divisions. This has helped build bridges across campus, both for our research and for our students. We now have STEM students taking classes at GPS. 
working as science policy fellows, working to decarbonize the UC and San Diego um, through the Deep Decarbonization Initiative, and finding their way to CCST and AAAS uh, policy fellowships. This has been a direct byproduct of the hiring of STEM faculty led by Peter. But there's another key point. Uh, you know, you can have vision and you can recruit a different kind of faculty through a bunch of different mechanisms, but you also need to mentor these young scholars and to make sure they get through the tenure process, which has historically been a very rigidly disciplinary uh, set of institutions. Here, I think Peter has been simultaneously visionary and mechanistic in figuring out how to recruit people working at these intersections of human and natural and physical and engineered systems and to mentor them to success. Instead of really viewing the traditional disciplinary organization of a university as gospel, Peter's instead had a vision here for what academic excellence looks like for each individual. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the chancellor in the EVC here, uh, as well as people like Josh, but, but with their help, Peter has led an effort to build mentorship structures that, that go beyond the bounds of, of our department and promotion standards that revolve around uh, inspiring each of us to be the best version of what we do, not just what other departments might lay out. And as other institutions have taken note and have seen what's happened here, any other number of other uh, deans and provosts and academic glitterati have, have reached out to Peter to understand how he could possibly make this happen. Um, so it really stands out externally, and, and I'll just say personally, it has also stood out uh, individually. When I was finishing my PhD, I really thought the academic road for me was done because there was no place in the world where it seemed like I would fit. Um, but first UCSD and Scripps uh, took a chance on me as a postdoc, thinking that what I had proposed to do was interesting. Uh, and then Peter and GPS really took the bigger risk on me hiring me as faculty. So uh, it, I think it's really just a, a testament from a very personal perspective uh, to him that now, eight years later, I really can't imagine it any other way. And that brings me to the third lesson of Peter, which is this. Um, Peter truly believes that we're all in the boat together here, whether we're talking about GPS or, you know, out in concentric circles to, to Spaceship Earth. And it's infinitely better when we're good to each other. This is something that's often in short supply in academia, uh, in policy, in other circles that Peter has roamed. Um, but we're so lucky that that's not the case in every place that Peter has touched. In short, Peter is a mensch. He's got a rock solid moral compass and he cares deeply about the lives and welfare of his faculty. He's never ever tried to separate out the fact that he's a father or a spouse or a community member uh, in the hallways at GPS. He models that uh, professionalism and leadership are really uh, best served up from the warmest parts of our hearts. I'm convinced that this quality would have made him an innovative and excellent leader no matter what path he might have taken, uh, but I'm equally convinced that it's a key component of how he's helped to make GPS such a unique and special place, including through integration of um, broader fields like STEM into a policy school. So, I will stop there. Peter, thank you. We will do our very best to carry these lessons forward uh, at GPS and beyond. Thank you, Jen, for that wonderful and insightful set of observations, um, distilling a lot down into classic Peter style three talking points. So I really like that. Um, we're gonna switch gears now briefly and turn to a video participant uh, and now we're going to, unfortunately, Enrico Letta could not join us, but he was very delighted to be asked and to, to provide a video tribute to Peter. For those of you who don't know, Enrico served as the Prime Minister of Italy from 2013 to 2014. After serving as Prime Minister, Letta went on to be the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po University in France. Uh, where he began to establish a collaboration with Peter. We'll hear a little more about. He was a visiting Pacific Leadership Fellow at CGT in April of 2017, tying all the circles back together here. Uh, Enrico is now back on the political front line as leader of the center-left Democratic Party as of March of this year in Italy. So you could imagine it's hard for him to participate uh, at this moment. He's become dear friends with Peter and Margaret. He, he again expressed his Great disappointment that he couldn't be here, but uh, we're delighted to have a video to share with all of you now. 
It was for me a great pleasure, great honor, and really the greatest experience working with Peter, Peter Cowie. Uh, working with him on economic diplomacy, we decided to launch all together this new experience. And today that we are all uh, very familiar with uh, Zoom method, with uh, uh, teaching, uh, distance teaching, and uh, uh, all these activities that because of pandemic are today very, very usual. Uh, two, day, two years ago, uh, two, two years ago, it was not so usual. It was uh, very uh, unnormal and very difficult. So when we met, with the idea, how can we um, make possible uh, four universities uh, from America, from Europe, and from Asia, Seoul, Paris, Montreal, and San Diego? Is it possible to give our students the possibility to share the activities, the teaching activities, research activities uh, from these universities uh, so far from each other? Uh, with uh, this big and very interesting mission of economic diplomacy. We were in a very sad period for multilateralism. And the idea was uh, uh, economic diplomacy is a mission, is a dream. Now the dream is reality because we work together. And thanks to Peter. Peter showed leadership. Uh, he was able always to find the right solutions. He was able to put together people from Korea, people from Quebec, myself, people from the OECD, and he was always very good with his smile, his fantastic smile, his leadership. I miss you. I miss your leadership, Peter. I'm sure that uh, uh, we are all missing your leadership, but I would like to thank you so much for this great experience. Bye bye. See you soon. Wait for you in Paris or in Rome. Hope to see you soon. Thank you, Enrico. I wish I could come to Paris or Rome myself. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce a dear friend. Uh, Gordon Hansen is the Peter Wertheim Professor in Urban Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School. His research is focused on globalization and how globalization in the form of immigration and expanded trade with China have affected US local labor markets. Prior to joining Harvard in 2020, uh, Gordon was on the GPS faculty here for nearly two decades. And while I hope you don't take any offense to this, Gordon. You are no Robert Duvall. You were, in fact, chief consigliere to Peter for many, many years. And your influence can be seen on most activities within the school today, not least of which at CGT, where you served as founding director. You've been a tremendous friend and mentor to many of us here at GPS. And we're really delighted to have you here uh, to talk about uh, Peter's vision and leadership at GPS. Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, it really is an, an honor to be here. Uh, GPS and UCSD are still very close uh, to my heart, uh, and I look forward to many more years of, of continued involvement with both the school and, and the university. I'm delighted to continue to be a senior fellow at CGT, um, and Josh, hope that you'll you'll keep me on the roster uh, for, for much time to come. I um, uh, it's just uh, it's a it's an honor for me to talk about Peter. Uh, I count him as a mentor, a colleague, a friend, someone to whom I owe an enormous debt of, of gratitude. He allowed me and he helped me make the most of my abilities as a scholar uh, and a professional. Uh, and I can't imagine uh, what my career would have been like without his close guidance and insight. Um, and willingness to, to take risks uh, time and time again. What, what I'd like to talk about though is, um, is the Cowie model. How did Peter take GPS to the next level? I had um, the opportunity to be one of several Robins to Peter's Batman and so got to see him in action and got uh, some insight in terms of, um, of how he pulled stuff off. 
And it is, in a sense, kind of somewhat straightforward to describe, but, but really hard to pull off. Uh, it requires vision, daring, the right partners. Um, and as I'm sure Chancellor Kosla will appreciate, that, uh, that certain Chicago-born willingness to bend rules that need uh, bending. It also helps if people like you and respect you and trust you. And I think we, we all know how immensely likable uh, Peter is, but also how much we trust him. I always felt that Peter had my back and, and my full support in what I was doing while at GPS. So what is the Cowie model? Uh, I would emphasize four elements. The first, and this kind of roughly follows the timeline in terms of, of, of Peter's impact on GPS. The first and how we began was to professionalize the staff. He knew that without a first rate team of folks in admissions, student services, career services, exec ed and the Global Leadership Institute, development and alumni relations, that he couldn't realize his vision. And so working with Deb Morrison and Teresa Olsamendi, uh, he brought together an absolutely first-rate team of folks that I had the, the privilege to work with uh, for many years. In doing so, he kind of pulled an inverse Kevin Costner in terms of what he did in the movie Field of Dreams. So Kevin Costner built a baseball diamond in the middle of an Iowa cornfield and trusted that people would come. What Peter did was to bring the people together and then look at the university and say, I've got an incredible collection of people here. Where do you expect them to sit and work? Uh, and was able to get the university to then uh, upgrade facilities uh, at the school to now uh, house uh, our staff in, 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 and provide classrooms in a truly, truly beautiful environment. Part two of what Peter did was to institutionalize scholarship. And this uh, Chancellor uh, Kosla uh, spoke about very eloquently, working with faculty leaders, Susan Shirk, Josh Graf Sivan, Rafael Fernandez de Castro, uh, Jen Burney, myself on occasion, and then also with visionary supporters of the school, Jonah Norwin Jacobs, Aaron Feldman, uh, Marion and Juan So, Rafael Pastor, to build a world-class set of, of research centers. In so doing, there was a, a certain magic here. Uh, some faculty were easy to bring along because they had a natural entrepreneurial bent. Most faculty don't. Uh, and this is what Josh alluded to in his wonderful analogy about managing a faculty like managing an, an orchestra. For Peter to build out the school, he had to get some of the clarinetists to play cymbals. Now, if you just went and asked him straight out, the clarinetist would say, no, I'm a clarinetist. I don't play cymbals. I'm not going to do that. But Peter had a magic of introducing possibilities to people such that the clarinetist would come to Peter and say, I want to play the cymbals. Please let me play the cymbals. Uh, and through this sort of, uh, of, of gentle guidance, uh, Peter helped get the most out of GPS faculty in building an incredible selection uh, of, of institutions uh, in the school. Part three was to build an outstanding board. So Peter's great friendship and partnership with Jim Jamison, and then more recently, his partnership with Rael, Rafael Pastor has created in the International Advisory Board a simply world-class collection of individuals drawn from business, from the policy world, and from GPS alumni who serve as a sounding board, uh, as a source of support, uh, and as a market test. Before we uh, rolled ideas out for new initiatives, programs, um, uh, uh, as part of Peter's uh, agenda for the school, we would test drive them with the International Advisory Board. They were a tough audience, but an audience that helped improve the product that the school was developing immensely. The fourth and final part of the, the Cali model is something that Chancellor Kosoff also uh, spoke about. And that was the manner in which uh, Peter leveraged UCSD strengths in building out the school. So this was working with Chancellor Kosla to make GPS the nexus of where STEM meets public policy. Uh, and this also involved working with other partners on, uh, on campus, Margaret Lainan, the Scripps uh, Institution of Oceanography, Al Fasano in engineering, uh, and others. And this came out of an incredible strategic planning process, which has been alluded to, but you, it's, it's hard, if you're, if you're not a faculty member, it, it's hard to imagine how discordant the connection of strategic planning 
the faculty actually is. So it's sort of like imagining Dwight Eisenhower show, showing up to lead the troops. And on the left hand, the left side of the room, you've got the Marx Brothers. And on the right side of the room, you have the Three Stooges. Uh, and somehow you've got to turn this group into a fighting force. What uh, Pradeep and what Peter did through the strategic planning process for the campus as a whole and for GPS was to turn that uh, collection of comedians into the Navy SEALs. Um, and what came out of it was an incredible vision for how GPS could serve as a role both to apply the scientific rigor coming out of STEM into the policy-oriented research that was being done in the school, uh, but also to challenge the STEM side of camp uh, campus to make their work relevant to the burning policy debates uh, of the day. And so this is one of those only at UCSD things. Um, it's, uh, it's and in so doing, Peter built the sort of policy school that, that a place like MIT wish it had. And there's a nimbleness there that, uh, as I've learned, certain older East Coast institutions uh, simply don't have. Uh, and that innovativeness, that daring, um, and that risk-taking, which characterizes the UCSD way. It was just a, a thrill for me uh, to be part of this. What Peter has done has had a deep and lasting impact on faculty, on staff, on students, on the San Diego and global community. And the love, the outpouring of love for Peter uh, as he approaches uh, the next stage of his career is testimony to how he changed our lives and made us uh, better people in the, in the process. Peter, my hat is off. Thanks, Gordon. I'm not, I'm not quite sure I feel like a Navy SEAL, but uh, I like the idea of it in any case. Um, I, I just want to add something to your remarks here, which is uh, something we've heard this morning. And I, I think it's true. I hadn't really made the connection. I think it's true when we think about Peter's faculty life as well. Peter enters a room, particularly around, say, a strategic planning exercise with faculty, knowing where he wants to end up. And I think that is hugely valuable, not that he comes in and insists that we end up there, but that he knows where he wants to end up and he guides a conversation so that we all realize that where Peter wants to end up is actually where we want to end up. I think that that is, in fact, part of his genius. So thank you for those comments. Uh, I am delighted now to introduce uh, our next and final panelist, Erwin uh, Jacobs. Erwin, as nearly all of you know, uh, was the founding chairman and CEO emeritus of Qualcomm. He also has a long connection to UCSD. Uh, he led the commercialization of CDMA technology and its success as the world's fastest growing, most advanced voice and data wireless communications technology. And I just wanna say on a personal level, while Irwin has made his reputation in engineering and computer science, he really is truly a polymath. He's curious and knowledgeable about a great number of subjects. And every time I have had the great pleasure of speaking with Erwin, he surprises me about how much he knows about my very own discipline. In some cases, things I have not even myself had a chance to read. He's a tremendous supporter of UCSD over the years and of GPS. And we are tremendously grateful for the gift that was just announced. Thank you, Erwin. Thank you, Joan. Erwin, the floor is all yours. Uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Josh. It's, it's been great hearing all the talks and, in fact, getting a lot more information about Peter than I was aware of in the past. And I'll touch on that shortly. I think my first meeting with Peter was back in May 95 at a breakfast meeting for IRPS. And during that meeting, I asked Peter a question about how do we increase our possibilities of licensing equipment in various international, various foreign countries. We were just getting ready to start shipping equipment manufactured here in San Diego to Hong Kong, and on also to South Korea. So Qualcomm was beginning to move into the international area. 
I, as an engineer, had very little experience in international relations and different customs in different countries. And so it was very helpful to be able to talk with Peter and others in IRPS at the time and be able to gather some of that information. And Peter was very gracious, as he always is, and offered to meet after the breakfast meeting and talk about these things a little further. So those discussions went on. Well, we did begin to ship CDMA, but we also entered into what was often referred to as religious wars between GSM, which was a uh, 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 technology that an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding among European countries that they only use GSM, that it began to become very competitive around the world. They were pressing ahead to be able to spread GSM. We were trying to introduce CDMA. We started a few years later. And so it was very helpful to uh, get advice and suggestions. But even more, um, there were fairly early on uh, discussions of 2G was focused, second generation was focused on voice. We needed a third generation that would handle internet access as well as more efficient voice. And so those discussions uh, did go on. What I had not realized until this symposium was the role that Peter played in opening up international communications with a focus on having an open internet among countries and also fair pricing, how much of that contributed really to the interest in the European countries and worldwide in having this data capability, this new generation of wireless communications. And so that really did help stimulate the movement uh, to 3G. Not that it was easy. Uh, for example, the uh, ministerial level at the EU became interested in the competition and uh, had to go back and have discussions. And luckily, Peter was available to discuss how best to approach these and to think about what's important to them, what's important to us, and how do you find a meeting ground uh, between those two issues. In any case, um, we did finally get that third generation in place. There were additional battles with China, again, some help with Peter and how best to handle those. And um, over time, of course, the world did go with third generation. And then we had to go to fourth generation. Of course, now we're talking about fifth generation. So Peter's been some help uh, for us in, in that period. Another area that was interesting, because of this fact that cellular was spreading worldwide, the question was how do we um, best provide other kind of capabilities? Obviously, the, the general uh, communications were important, but how might we provide some other civilian uses that were important? And in one discussion uh, with Peter, uh, his connection with the Grameen Foundation came up and uh, mentioned to him that we we're setting up a, a wireless reach program with various uh, uh, capabilities being uh, uh, provided to different countries using uh, the wireless. And he suggested uh, talking with Grameen Foundation about a village phone program where one can provide a package with a phone and a license with a local company, advertising material, big battery, big antenna. And so how we might move ahead with the uh, village phone project. And uh, that did go ahead well initially. I think we started in Indonesia. Um, but fairly quickly, everybody around the world began to buy began to buy their own cell phone so they didn't need to get it from a, uh, a woman who was selling a service. And so then the question came up of what do you do about that? How do you go further? And um, 
uh, talking with Peter, talking with many others, including some students that had come and worked at uh, Qualcomm from my RPS, um, came up with some other entrepreneurial approaches that you could build into the cell phones, banking type issues, job finding issues, et cetera, and continue to allow those women that had gotten into the village phone prog program to remain entrepreneurial. So that was kind of a, another interesting uh, approach an overlap that I didn't really uh, expect at the beginning, but it turned out to be very useful. And in fact, at one of those meetings, uh, I met uh, Marshall Saunders, who later set up the Citizens Climate Lobby, and which ended up establishing uh, volunteer groups in just about every congressional district, and has been working very much for uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions, going toward a carbon tax, uh, for example. Unfortunately, Marshall died recently, and we were very pleased to be able to set up the chair that Jennifer now holds uh, in his name. So that was another kind of connection that came along. Well, back in 2006, uh, Peter approached Jonah and myself came over to visit our home and said he had this idea for a center on emerging and Pacific economies. And gave us some of the, sketched out some of the ideas for that center and added to it that it would also include a Pacific Leadership Fellows Program. And so all those ideas sounded interesting. We agreed we'd fund it for a year, see how it was going, then another year and another year. And uh, it just continued on and costs kept getting better and better. Well, in 2014, uh, back came Peter and probably Gordon with him at the time and talked about um, a change, a uh, repositioning of the center to be the center on global transformations. That sounded interesting, nothing like a huge idea, global transformations. And so that, uh, that did interest us. And then they had a little extra that uh, with a small additional uh, support level, uh, they could do uh, support some research in the program. And so we became uh, again interested in providing that and um, have been following both all the programs that they're involved with get a usually yearly support, but on the research side, uh, uh, some interesting things with the big pixel initiative that does involve uh, engineering, for example. Um, some work on the footprint of human activities on some work that uh, involves uh, uh, semi arid ecosystems, a whole range of interesting things. And of course, Jenna is involved with the, the latter of those. Um, and so we um, um, have been excited about that program. And that's why, as the chancellor announced earlier, Joe and I decided that we would like to provide an endowment to make sure that that will continue indefinitely into the future and continue to do great work and be named for Peter and that it expresses Joan and I, and I'm sure all of our great respect for everything that Peter has accomplished. So we're very pleased to be able to uh, have that as a continuing tribute to Peter's great work with GPS Now. Also like to acknowledge that he has been just a wonderful friend, he and Margaret. Over the years, we look forward in his retirement of perhaps having a few more minutes to be able to spend time together. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Peter, and congratulations. Thank you, Erwin. I think we're going to be joined now by um, our other panelists for our panel discussion, which will be a little brief here. Uh, I have prepared sort of one big-ish question to kick us off. Um, and I have a, there are two versions of this question. Uh, the first is, is maybe the easier one. I'll lay them both out and you can choose, you all can collectively choose which to answer to. The first is, 
simply to recognize that on this panel, we have Erwin, a successful businessman and philanthropist. We have the chancellor of the university and we have current and former faculty members. So I just wanna reiterate something I said earlier. A good dean has to speak to a lot of audiences and that is no easy task. And on this panel, we have quite a few different audiences. And so I'd sort of ask all of you to think about and, and maybe offer some insight about why Peter has been so effective as an entrepreneur in a way that resonates for your particular audience. And if you can say a few words about how your particular, how that pitch, if you will, helps or resonates <laughs> and connects you, helps to connect you to say other audiences that you don't necessarily occupy. Here's the bad news. That's the easy question. <laughs> the, the hard question, is uh, I'm going to go back to my my math major days and try by try, try to engage in proof by contradiction. So here's what I think is the harder question. I'd ask each of you to say something about what your professional or for that matter personal life might be like had you not met Peter. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, I, I can kick, I can kick it off uh, because I will probably have the simplest of all the answers. So. What makes Peter a great entrepreneur, a great strategist in the context of my people, which is primarily my domain as being faculty uh, and administrators? Uh, I think what makes Peter so interesting and exciting for me is you just have to drop a hint of an idea and Peter's mind is racing faster than yours. And he's connecting the dots and going to the idea even before you finish the sentence, right? Uh, he can see how it can be used to gain an edge. An edge in this case was primarily for GPS, but for me as chancellor, an edge for GPS is the same as an edge for UC San Diego. So I really, it didn't bother me. It might have bothered other deans, right? So those were the two things. And he was very, very quick on his feet. Uh, and like I said, he's a deep intellect. And that one cannot underestimate the impact of, especially when leading the faculty. A deep intellect is a necessary condition to lead the faculty. So that's where I come from. Well, um, I'm not sure uh, all of the areas in which Peter has uh, affected us. We've been on some trips together. Um, we've uh, uh, learned quite a bit. But I think the most interesting aspect recently has been his continuing interest in telecommunications and these days, of course, in fifth generation 5G and all the things that it might accomplish. And then in some sense in connection um, with China, uh, this question of both where do they stand, where we stand, how do we manage to keep up competitively uh, with China and 5G and in fact going on to 6G and also with Huawei, how does Huawei uh, fit in? Do we have to really take these very strong steps about simply borrowing that equipment? And of course, not necessarily being able to convince everybody to buy their equipment, or is there perhaps some better uh, approach to that? So we, we've had those discussions and uh, hopefully something indeed will come out of it. But I think the main thing again with Peter, uh, whenever you have start a small discussion, it gets stretched and carries on into something that's fascinating. So I hope that just continues on. Sure. Um, so Peter is uh, in, in settings, in public settings, Peter's a light force. Uh, he has this ability to connect in real time across all the different uh, communities of people in, uh, with which he's engaged and makes you feel like you're in conversation with people you've never even met. Um, and that comes from, you know, uh, aside from just a deep raw intelligence, a deep emotional intelligence. He's an incredibly empathetic person. And with one question, he can get insight into a group that allows him to connect with people and figure out what they're about, what they're concerned about, and how he can help uh, them get where he and they both uh, want to go. Um, and it's just a marvel to behold. And this is true among 30 something faculty, and it's true among 60 something international advisory board uh, members. 
terms of how my life would have been different. Um, Peter understands misfits. Um, he understands people who kind of fall in between worlds and who are frustrated by the standards that they face in one world where they want to they don't want to be put in a uh, in a in a narrow academic box. And he allowed me to uh, fully embrace my misfit side and just take it in whatever direction uh, I wanted. And so I would have been uh, a much more stunted and much more frustrated scholar, but for Peter's impact on my life. I'll just build on that last point that um, Gordon made. Um, Peter uh, engages first and foremost as a human uh, who cares about other people and and wants to know where they're coming from and, and what they're dealing with and how he can help them be the, be the best version of themselves. And, and that of course uh, means academically, but it also means um, as a whole person. So uh, I guess maybe um, one way that I think I would um, be different uh, and hasn't been spoken about that much um, is just that Peter has encouraged us to be activists within the university. Um, I think a lot of folks would tell junior faculty, you know, keep your head down, do your work, don't make noise. Um, and Peter said, you know what? There's a lot of things that could be better. You see equity issues, you see diversity issues, you see inclusion issues, go make noise. And his door was always open uh, to, to cash in the mentoring chip, um, to learn you know, some new tidbit about how the system works and to go make this place better. He's been a real champion, a, a real quiet and, um, you know, in very typical Peter way, champion um, for his faculty um, as people and for, for issues of equity and inclusion and diversity at, at the campus level. So I, I, I think I would have felt um, a little less inclined to be outspoken if I hadn't had somebody saying, no, no, this is what you need to do, go do it. Thanks. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm struck in part because we're at the end of, of our day or pretty close to the end of our day. And we've heard lots of things from lots of folks about various aspects of Peter's life and career. And I have to say, I come into this conversation with, with quite a few you know, pre-baked ideas about Peter myself. Um, one thread that I think is there, although maybe not so prominent, um, Gordon mentioned it specifically, but I think it's implicit in so much of what we've heard is trust. People, people trust Peter. Uh, Pradeep trusts Peter to give him good advice. Uh, Erwin trusts Peter to give good advice. Gordon trusts Peter to let him be a freak and to give him good advice. Um, and, 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 and Jen trusts Peter to, to, to do what she thinks is right. And I, I think that trust comes from a variety of things in Peter. Uh, it's his ability to listen. It's it's his generosity of spirit. It's hu it's his humility. But that trust seems pretty fundamental to this very difficult exercise of bringing lots and lots of parts and pieces together. And so I wanted to just underscore that as something, at least for me, when I had my list of adjectives for Peter, I had many, and of course I trust him. But that wasn't at the top of my list, and so I want to I want to put it there. I want to now. Maybe to put Jen on the spot for a second here, Jen, you represent something pretty unique in the academic world and something you were you were you were the in some sense the the first investment, but 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 there's been cascading investment since. You know, you're a science PhD and a fact and this speaks to Gordon's point about Peter embracing the inner weird of all of us or encouraging or supporting the inner weird of all of us. You have a PhD in physics and you are on our faculty doing policy work. And I can tell you, because I remember when we hired you, you weren't totally sure what that even meant when we hired you. And so I, I wonder if you could just say a little bit about what it means to be a science faculty member at GPS and in particular, what you think it signals to the outside world, because Peter has made this career around this intersection of science and policy and technology. And while he's practiced that in his professional life to sort of imbue a school with that uh, character, 
in a way that's visible to the outside is not easy. So I've said too much, please. I'd love to hear any thoughts you have. Sure. I mean, I would just say I'll, I'll quickly kick it to the rest of this panel who can also speak to this. Um, but and I actually think Stefan said it best earlier, right, which is that, um, you know, somebody who's going to fit in a in a just a straight physics department or an engineering department uh, might be interested in the way the thing works, whatever it is, um, for its own sake. But um, there are a lot of us who care about the way things work because it interacts with people. Um, and Peter, I think, has held that as the core for sort of integrating um, STEM here, which is that you know you got to know the you got to know the technical details, you got to understand how, how the system works, and and particularly for how, why it matters, as Stefan so eloquently said earlier, for for decisions that that people or groups need to take. So that that to me really stands out as the the thread that ties us all together, no matter what our degrees say. Um. So you know, one of the things that uh, that makes Peter so successful in allowing us to tap into uh, capabilities, to desires, <laughs> to a willingness to do things that we didn't know we have is that um, he breaks with what's become a bit of a uh, of a, a negative part of the modern model of scholarship in which you're really focused on you and what you do. And when it comes to serving the institution, you just kind of check the boxes. Peter comes to this with an old school sensibility in which this is about public service and it's vital, it's important, and you should really feel it as a deep part of what you do. And he doesn't bring that as a burden or in a preachy way, but in an inspirational way. Um, and so in letting, uh, you're watching Jen's career flourish, which has just been a, just a, a, a joy. Um, you saw him help her go from her scholarship, just like he did with me and just like he did with you, to say, there's some leadership things out there that are just a natural extension of that, of that process of growth. Um, and he models that behavior himself, and he inspires that behavior uh, in others. So Pradeep, I, I want to, I, I see you nodding. I'd love to hear your thoughts also on that, that sense of civic ownership and, and, and leadership and commitment from Peter, uh, which I, I, I'm going to put you on the spot and say, I assume is important to you, uh, but I'd love, we'd love to hear more. <laughs> you, you assume too much. No, just kidding. Jack. No, I mean, look, clearly uh, GPS would not be the high impact place uh, that it has been if there was no sense of ownership and civic responsibility. But let me decide, uh, define civic responsibility in two different ways. One is responsibility to people around you. In this case, what it would mean is what is GPS's responsibility to people around them, which is UC San Diego broadly defined. And that's why GPS is in the center of this place, because Peter figured that out that if GPS was going to be civically responsible, it would automatically be the center. And then he would be the driving force behind multiple agendas. So trying to integrate STEM. Uh, the short conversation I had with him, I said, Peter, you know, a great institution like this with science and technology, it doesn't make sense. This my early on when I got here, actually, even before I got here, it doesn't make sense to have no school that does policy in the, uh, has policy in the name, even though GPS does a lot of policy. Next thing I know is like a year later, uh, Qualcomm is funding some study, and the answer is the school is going to be from IRPS to global policy and strategy. We were talking about building design. Next thing I know, there's PDAL in GPS. So Peter always saw how in the context of the bigger vision of this institution, what could GPS do? And in that, mind, that in my mind, was his way of uh, talking about what was his civic responsibility, not just to GPS, but GPS is responsibility to the institution. Right. Thank you, Erwin. I'm going to put you on the spot for the last word, and I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to try to draw a thread here, which is you in your in your long and storied career. You've you've been an academic, you've been a successful business person, and you've been a community builder through yours and Jones' philanthropy, both locally and and nationally and internationally. So. I just ask you to say maybe something about that, those threads that we see in our in our conversations about Peter, what what you know bring us home here, Erwin. 
Well, I must say, first of all, I, I was an academic for 13 years, MIT, and then at UCSD. And that really gave me a great foundation in being able to then take the theory that we've been teaching for many years and bring that out and show that indeed it is useful. And so I'm always a strong supporter of people getting as much education as they can and being able to then apply that in a variety of ways. The going into business, I often say with something like academics, uh, in one sense, uh, you meet with some employees, you give them some ideas, you suggest ways to move forward, off they go, they come back, uh, you discuss repoint. So it's something like guiding a thesis student, except you're looking for a product as opposed to a, a, a piece of paper. Um, the other half of your time uh, is occupied with business aspects and uh, talking to customers and finances, a whole range of other things. At the university, a significant part of your time is with committees. And so the advantage of having moved to business is that you can make decisions. <clears throat> and so that's something I think that perhaps the academic world might learn a little better from the business world. Um, the philanthropic aspect, of course, uh, is something that we feel very lucky about that we've uh, over the years been able to be in a position to make those kind of contributions. But again, it's interesting, we, we base our philanthropy on three areas, uh, you know, uh, the subject, uh, the area that the philanthropy is working in, and education is clearly one that we give a very high priority to. Uh, secondly, uh, would our contribution make a difference uh, longer term? Might it not happen if we didn't make that contribution? And thirdly, uh, does it have good leadership? And so clearly the university, and in this case now, uh, GPS and the uh, Center on Global Transformations, the leadership is there. And so again, we're very pleased to be able to be supporting that. And so over the years, having these discussions back and forth with Peter, Margaret, many others, but in particular, they always um, are, are very, very good as far as when we make a, give them a thought, a way to go, that's always an improvement suggested. And so it's very, very good to be able to interact with people that have that kind of ability. Wonderful, thank you. Um, thank, thanks to all of our panelists for a stimulating discussion. Um, we really appreciate your time and your insights. Uh, we're coming to almost to the close of our program here. Um, it is my great honor and pleasure right now to introduce the Honorable Margaret McCune, Circuit Judge for the Ninth Cir Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, many of you know uh, Margaret. Margaret is a rock star in judicial circles, and uh, I don't say that lightly. She's even opined on controversial rock star cases, probably not your most difficult case, but at least for me, uh, one of my favorite cases I know that Margaret has handled regarding copyright infringement on Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. Uh, she's among my favorite people with which to schmooze, and she also happens to be Peter's wife of more than 35 years. Uh, it's cliche to say behind every good man is a great woman, but in this case, I cannot think of a more true statement to make. Margaret, the floor is all yours. I was asked to introduce Peter, and that really left me rather flummoxed because I thought that's what you'd been doing for about three or four hours today. And as you know from the meetings, his intellectual and academic heart has been at UCSD for 45 years. It's a long time. But that's what he really considers his home. And of course, he would leave UCSD periodically to go to the White House to do some nonprofit leadership with Grameen Foundation or California Council of Science and Technology. He engaged in all kind of, uh, I would say, um, dizzying array of acronyms like IRPS, EDC, 
OPEC, FCC, USTR, CCST, et cetera. But in the end, I know that we all appreciate he's much, much more than that. For me, he's been a loving husband. He's been an amazing father to Haruka. And he's a big man with a big heart. What you might not know is that he's also a fabulous cook. But it won't surprise you that he's totally iconoclastic in his cooking. And much like his academic career, he doesn't follow a straight line and he doesn't follow a recipe. But what comes out is really an amazing creation. For me, one of the great joys of these past decades has been having the faculty and the students and the board at GPS as really part and parcel of our family. And I hope that will continue. Lots of you had advice for Peter for what he should do next. And I know he has an open mind and he'll listen to that. People always ask me, well, what lies ahead? I can't tell you that, but I can tell you that it will be incredibly interesting. It will be intellectually challenging and it will be global. And I know it will include lots of international travel. But for me, it will be yet another adventure of a lifetime with Peter. So with that, Peter, you now have the opportunity to respond to everyone. Um, this last uh, panel has illustrated why the school has prospered. Um, a lot of it has been attributed to me, but so much of it is because of everything that everybody else has done. There's been the great support from the campus leadership. And I will say that uh, I made it to 19 years because when Pradeep came in as chancellor, it was like a second uh, rejuvenation for me in uh, leadership. He had a vision for the campus that I could understand and a strategy that we could build on together in a way that I think served both the larger campus and the school. So thank you, Pradeep, for all of that. It's also been the result of an amazing faculty, uh, a faculty that believes in service and leadership in their own right. And if I had tried to do all the things that the school has done in innovation and imagining new things, we would have failed. But the ability to get people like Josh and Gordon and Jen and so many others on the faculty over the years, veterans like Steph Haggard, the amazing younger faculty that we've recruited, has all led to the dynamics of GPS. And it's truly a community. And of course, we couldn't have done this without extraordinary supporters who have the vision and generosity to allow us to pursue our best ideals. You know, having said that about supporters, I would have never have dreamt, including even last week, that I would ever be uh, the recipient of uh, an honor like having the center name for me. And all I can say to Erwin and Joan is that I promise that whatever retirement means, it will not include uh, shirking the effort to bring my skills and passion to bear and making the center fulfill all of its next dreams for change and transformation. Now, uh, as uh, I prepared for today, I fell back on the habits of a scholar, which is to say I had to do research about how to say thank you. Uh, and to prepare, I decided I would study the acceptance speeches on YouTube from the Academy Awards, the Emmys, and the Mark Twain Humor Prize. Uh, that was actually quite enlightening, uh, made me understand a whole number of things about those ceremonies never had quite picked up on before. I won't try to take you through all the things that I discovered, but let me just illustrate it with two uh, principles that I discovered that ran through all the acceptance speeches. The first I've sort of dubbed as the Sally Fields moment. It's when the recipient discovers that maybe it's not just fluke luck, but maybe the fact that people actually like them that has led to the award. Uh, this was most famously illustrated by Sally Fields herself, 
who those of us of a certain age will remember, started her career as the flying nun on TV when she got her second Academy Award for Best Actor. And she famously blurted out, oh, this means that you like me. You really do like me. Well, uh, today, uh, I accept the fact that you like me. The second uh, uh, theme was uh, what I've come to think of as the thank you dilemma. And the thank you dilemma simply means that you finally understand that thanking everyone who deserves it will take far too long and you'll still miss some deserving people and thereby achieving that rare neat trick of both boring and offending people in the same speech. So I'm going to ask you to forbear from hearing long thanks. I owe so many of you those thanks and I will try to follow up in private. But I cannot pass up thanking a handful of people for today. Uh, one of the tricks to being a successful dean, as Gordon Hansen uh, revealed, uh, is recruiting great people to be the staff who really drive the train and make it work and save you from your worst foolishness in your thoughts as a dean. And I have been very, very fortunate to have a wonderfully skilled and incredibly hardworking staff. And two of them really took on the point role for this uh, day. And they are our Peter Vergesi and Jean Karenke. I didn't ask them to do this. They volunteered to do it. Um, they may have discovered it was even more than they imagined as a labor, but they've been just great. And of course, uh, you have seen, for those of you with us last night and today, uh, the hand of Susan Shirk, who has been a magnificent colleague and friend, and if you would, co-institution builder over all these years. You know, my years at UCSD have been a joy because from the first day as an assistant professor, I recognized that UCSD was really a case where we were building something special, something distinctive, and that it would fit high ideals, but it wouldn't make the mistake of simply trying to replicate the formula of past successes, such as the great East Coast research universities. I've long believed that the modern research university is the American civilization's answer to the great cathedrals of ancient Europe. They invested in um, spiritual, if you would, uh, transcendence symbolized by their cathedrals. We invested in the discovery of knowledge. You know, the credo of the University of California system is fiat lux, which my four years of Latin tells me roughly translates as let there be light, or perhaps more appropriately and accurately as let us create the light. So I want to thank all of you for sharing this ideal. Let's continue to create the light that can make the world better. Finally, uh, to Margaret and Haruka, thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I'm. I just want to close here by by reiterating first and foremost a thank you to Peter for all the tremendous insight and service to all of us over all these years. We look forward to hearing about the next chapter and we look forward to engaging you in, in all those activities as, as, you, as you reinvent yourself yet again. Uh, I also wanna thank um, the staff who've made this possible as sad as it is to admit, uh, I'm just the pretty face here and that's pretty dark, um, but uh, so many people 
were involved in making this a seamless event that's ending almost exactly on time. So I wanna just make sure that everyone um, that's been involved, all the staff that have been involved at GPS and beyond, thank you so much for making this a wonderful and seamless event. And thanks to everyone, everyone who uh, contributed to these panels, everyone who contributed uh, to this event for making this event special and important and memorable. Uh, thanks to everyone. Have a wonderful Friday and a lovely weekend. Uh, goodbye to everyone. Thanks.